Hello and welcome to another Shed Science number 14. Although technically this isn't in the shed, it is still a mess. I've been filming this in my kitchen actually, which I guess makes this kitchen science? Although that doesn't really sound as cat- So today I wanted to do two little experiments that you could do at home if you wanted to about buoyancy. Buoyancy is a force, it's a phenomenon about how things can float, so different things will have different buoyant forces and therefore float in different ways. You can experience this yourself in a bath or in the swimming pool. If you take a nice deep breath you'll find that you'll naturally float to the top to the surface of the water but if you let all the air out of your body, if you breathe out, you'll probably start to sink. This is because air is lighter than water. I mean, yeah, obviously, we all knew that, but this is proof. But if you fill something up with air, there'll be more of a buoyant force, things will start to float. You can, however, change the buoyant force by changing the density of the water. Density means how heavy something is for its space. You can do a really cool experiment at home to show this using a few very simple things. You need a bath toy, the type that you can squeeze water in and out of. I'm using a penguin. You need a jar, but not a jar, because I'll explain why not a jar in a moment. And you need some table salt, some normal everyday salt. First of all, you have to fill up your jar with water. I found out that I couldn't put my hand in the jar to be able to get the toy back out, and therefore I swapped over to a pint glass. So fill your pint glass with water, and you'll find that your bath toy can float, because it's full of air. However, if you squeeze all the air out of the bath toy while it's under the water, the air leaves and water will flow in. You can actually see the bubbles coming out of the penguin's mouth as it gets squeezed. That's the air leaving it. It's being replaced by water, and the water is denser and heavier. As you keep on replacing the air with the water, you'll see the bath toy doesn't float quite as well as it used to. Maybe it floats now just below the surface of the water. And at a certain point, when you've got enough water in there with a little bit of air, it will start to sink. You don't want to completely fill the bath toy with water. You want to leave a little bit of air in there. You want to get it just right so there's enough water in there to make it sink. Here's the fun bit. So now you just pour salt into the water. You wouldn't think this would change the water in any particular way, but it does! Because as salt dissolves in water, the water becomes more dense. The water becomes heavier for its space, and that water is heavier than the water inside the bath toy. So whereas the bath toy, with a little bit of air and water inside, used to sink in the water because it was denser, heavier than the water surrounding it, the water is now heavier than the bath toy. So salt water, or sea water, is denser. It's heavier for its space than pure water. But what's the point of doing this experiment only once? I have quite a few bath toys, and therefore I invite you all to watch the Bath Toy Olympics? The Great Bath Toy Race? I'll find a better name later. Step right up, ladies and gentlemen. Today we have the Great Buoyancy Race, and today we have five contestants. Contestants one to five are getting ready for their race right now. We have Percy the Penguin, Colin the Clownfish, Tommy the Turtle, Peter the Pufferfish, and bringing up the rear, we have Wally the Whale. I imagine our contestants are feeling the pre-race jitters as they're all prepared for their race. Now, for this race, all of our contestants are required to be less buoyant than the water around them, so they have all been emptied of the air inside. And the air inside them all has been carefully replaced by water. So before the race starts, all of our contestants are going to be more dense than the water surrounding them. And they're off, and you can see the adjudicator is adding salt to the water to make the water more dense than the water inside our five contestants. And Peter the Pufferfish is the first off of the starting line, climbing slowly towards the surface of the water. There isn't quite enough salt in the water yet to make him reach the top, but there he is, and he's followed very closely. Is it Wally the Whale? Is it Colin the Clownfish? It's anyone's race at this point. Oh, Wally the Whale takes a bit of a dive, which means Colin the Clownfish is the second contestant over the finishing line at the surface of the water. We have some bobbing here, ladies and gentlemen, but you can see that Wally the Whale is third, and Percy the Penguin is fourth across the finish line at the surface of the water, with Tommy the Turtle still lagging behind. What's this? The adjudicators are calling a timeout. Apparently Apparently the water is too cloudy to be able to call the match. That's because the adjudicators used cold water instead of hot water. Let's restart the race with hot water instead of cold water and see what happens. Hot water, of course, will dissolve the salt faster and therefore make it less cloudy. And as the starting pistol goes, we can already see that Peter the Pufferfish is the first across the finishing line. There's some bobbing, there's some ups and downs from other contestants. It's anyone's game, ladies and gentlemen, but Wally the Whale is the second of our contestants to reach the finishing line. Oh, that happened so fast it's very hard to call the race. We're going to have to go into an action replay. Third up by a hair's whisper, it's Colin the Clownfish, followed very closely by Tommy the Turtle, and Percy the Penguin brings up the rear as the fifth contestant across the finishing line. Look, um, lockdown life is hard, and we all need to take a break from reality and have a race with bath toys in our kitchen. 
as they float. So what that tells us is that if we have salt in water, it makes it more dense. That affects the buoyancy of the things that are in the water. I want to show you another experiment that you can do, and you are probably more likely to have the ingredients for this experiment. What you need for this are a straw, preferably a paper straw rather than a plastic straw, a bottle of water and a paper clip. With these we're going to make what's called a Cartesian diver. So how this works is we bend the straw in half and we put the two ends on the paper clip. What we want is the paper clip at the bottom keeping the weight down and what we actually get then is an air bubble in the straw. So then what you want to do is have a full, completely full to the brim bottle of water. You want to put your Cartesian diver in the water bottle with the paper clip at the bottom and the straw at the top and this keeps the air bubble from escaping. Put the diver in, make sure it's filled to the very top with water and then screw on the top of the water bottle. What you then do is squeeze the water bottle and for me it didn't work. I actually did this about five different times and the first four attempts didn't work. So if it doesn't work for you, start from scratch and have another go. When I finally got it to work, this is what happens when you squeeze the water bottle. Pretty cool, right? So when you squeeze the bottle you make the diver sink and when you relax it, it floats again. The reason this happens is really, really cool. So as you squeeze the water bottle, you're increasing the pressure inside. Now the water itself can't compress, it can't squeeze any smaller, but the very, very small air bubble inside the diver can. And what's important about the air bubble isn't actually how much air there is, it's how much space it's taking up. So when you squeeze the water bottle, the air bubble inside the diver gets smaller and that makes the diver denser, essentially heavier for its space. And because it's denser, it then sinks because it's denser than the water. It's a bit like the bath toy. There's essentially less volume of gas, less volume of air inside it, which makes it denser. When you release the water bottle, the opposite happens. There's less pressure and therefore the air bubble gets bigger. And with a bigger air bubble, the whole diver gets less dense. And because it's less dense, it floats. And believe it or not, this actually shows you how submarines work. So a submarine is a vehicle that has to be able to control how dense it is, because if it's too light, it'll float to the surface, and if it's too heavy, it'll just sink to the floor of the ocean. It needs to be able to change its density while it's in the water. Here's how it works. Inside the submarine, there are what are called ballast tanks. These ballast tanks are filled with water when the submarine starts its journey. Because the submarine's made out of quite heavy materials like metal, it starts to sink. However, at a certain point, you want the submarine to stop. To stop sinking, they have compressed gas tanks inside the submarine, and they let that gas out into the ballast tanks. As it does that, it changes the entire density of the whole submarine, and it makes the submarine less dense. Because the submarine is less dense, it stops sinking, and what you can actually get is the perfect balance of water and air for what we call neutral buoyancy. This is where a submarine won't sink or float, it'll just hang somewhere in the middle of the ocean. Again, this is a bit like the bath toy. If you get just the right amount of air inside the bath toy, it won't really sink, but it won't really float straight to the surface anyway. It'll kind of drift in the middle of the water. Then when the submarine wants to get back to the surface, it just releases more of the gas from those gas canisters. That gas goes into the ballast tanks, it expands, it gets bigger, and the whole submarine will become less dense. As it becomes less dense, it will start to rise to the surface. Because of the air in the ballast tanks, it is now lighter than the water surrounding it. So much like a bath toy or a Cartesian diver, if you change the amount of air, or I should say the volume of air, the space taken up by the air inside something, you change its buoyancy, you change its density, and you'll allow it to sink or float. I hope those two experiments do kind of explain how a submarine works for you. Obviously, in real life, submarines are really, really, really complicated, but that's the basic idea. I hope you found that useful and interesting. I hope you do those experiments at home if you can. Stay safe, be awesome, and thank you very much for watching. Bye-bye.